Okay, it's six. Uh, no, it's uh, four thirty-five. <clears throat> I am not Dr. Cone, but I'm Bill Stebbins, and I'm the Chief Development Officer here at Calvary University. And what I'm just going to do for the next probably five minutes, maybe not even that long, is it's just uh, it's really like a commercial. And so it's about the Calvary Cohort Program. This is the humor hour. And what you'll see at the bottom, bottom right hand corner in the red, the red square there, this is the, cow, the cohort program. And what you may or may not realize is that Calvary's attempting to do and has been doing the impossible. And you ask me, what's the impossible? The impossible is keeping tuition the lowest it can possibly be so low for the quality education, HLC, ABHE accredited degrees. But in the current environment in the United States, this is a very difficult thing to do in higher education. And so my charge is to figure out ways to keep Calvary University sustainable, despite the, uh, I'll call it abiotic environment, for those uh, institutions of higher learning that stick with the scriptures, that stick with the gospel unapologetically. And so this is what we're doing here. So the, the cohort program, uh, when you click on that bottom right hand button, it brings you to this. And as opposed to explaining all of it to you right now at the end of a, a, a longish day and maybe a, a hot day, you have two videos there where Dr. Cohn and myself explain the reason for the program and, and, and how it works. And what I'm excited to share with you, and I just want to get to the excitement. And the excitement is this. At the top, you'll see the cohort program has five tiers of individual patronage. And then at the bottom, we have church patronage, three tiers of church patronage. And you see some of the churches there who have already joined the church cohort. And here's the exciting thing about that. Uh, so I am retired from the military, was in 23 years. We talk about hermeneutical lenses and presuppositions and things like this. One of the lenses that I look at life through is a military lens. And I was talking with Dr. Cohn, and, and, and as I contemplated this, I thought, if we're doing what we say we're doing here, if we're standing for the gospel, if we're standing for God's word as the ultimate authority, if we are in fact doing that, we should have no stronger allies than the churches and their pastors. As such, the lens that I look all of this through is that the churches, the pastors, they're out on the front lines fighting spirit. Now, we're all fighting spiritual warfare. But in this metaphor, in this visual imagery that I have, they're out on the front lines fighting the battles. Calvary University is like World War II. This is the home front with the factories turning out the, the ammunition, turning out the machines and the tanks and, and basic training, pumping out the soldiers that march off to battle. What is it that we do here? We teach the Word of God. So many classes in depth. And so instead of just developing a system of patronage where we request, stand by us and give us financial security. No, it's symbiotic. Churches and individuals who stand by Calvary University, what we do in turn is we give resources out, just like the home front giving resources and material out to the troops on the front lines. What we give is the following. You see at the top, tokens of appreciation for ch church cohort members, and you follow the pointy, uh, well, it's, a, it's a pointer finger there, see, and it's pointing at full complimentary access to all Bible theology ministry classes that we teach, full access. Not only that, but you also get the syllabus for any class. Which means that if you want to dig even deeper, you could get the textbooks that the students use for those classes to go along with the videos, and you watch the videos at your pace. Down below, you see tokens of appreciation for individual cohort members. 
same thing. Now, why is that exciting and why is that important? You can see how this could be of incredible value for churches and for individuals. Most pastors that I've talked with basically are running short on time. It doesn't seem like time is something that they have gobs and gobs of, and yet they have a responsibility to bring up the next generation of Christian leaders. Well, armed with everything that we teach, Bible, theology, and ministry, now you have everything ready-made. You could take those young men and say, hey, we're meeting once a month. We're going through systematic theology one, and then two, and then three. Get this textbook. We're going to get together over coffee or breakfast once a month, and we're going to work through it. And the pastor doesn't have to single-handedly put all of that together. Now, rinse and repeat in these other scenarios. Uh, in the upper right, parents raising their children. The husband wants to be the spiritual leader of his family, but he didn't go to Bible college necessarily. He doesn't know how to necessarily put together classes. Guess what? You don't have to. You can go through Old Testament summary, Old Testament survey, New Testament, intro to the Bible, at your pace, in your family, at home, in addition to church. You can go through and do classes with your family and watch this. And, and you can see all the other examples. Bottom left, youth group. Youth group pastors. Well, now you have maybe the next six months or the next two months or in February, the youth group now, we're going to go through Hebrews or we're going to go through just... You know, you pick any class. It's additional things to arm and equip uh, pastors, anyone in the church. In the bottom right hand, breakout groups in your church. Adult Bible studies, breakout groups through the week. Well, instead of going, you know, often you go, you get a book. You go through a book. Yeah, you know what? Now you could do something a little different. Get together in your homes, watch videos, get the textbooks. It provides another avenue. So I wanted to bring this to your attention. I do have flyers on the back table just to the right of the coffee in the back. Please talk to me about this. We have churches right now, since we launched this thing, President's Dinner last year, we have church members from our church um, cohort churches, members calling us around the clock in the development office. Can we get this class? Can we get this class? And it's amazing. The word of God is, is going out in, in, in a very powerful way now. Um, and so with that, uh, I'll close here and I'll turn it over to someone vastly more entertaining than me and more intelligent than me. And that would be Dr. Cohn for your next presentation. Thank you, Bill. And, and by the way, let's, let's all give... Bill, a very sincere applause, and I'll tell you why in a second. Bill oversaw uh, all the logistics of this conference and uh, uh, helped to, to put it together and to hold it together, so we really appreciate that. We also very much appreciate Mr. Daniel Huxman. Let's give him a hand as he has been uh, controlling all the tech and the sound and has been so involved in that, he hasn't eaten the chocolate chip cookie that's sitting right next to him. So he's, he's uh, made it possible today for us to be live streaming to our, our folks in Colorado, our other campus in, in uh, Missouri as well, and, and many uh, uh, all over the place who are, are joining us and participating in this conference. Uh, and I, I want to share that we have been focusing today on quite a few uh, very foundational issues, and that's really the design today. Uh, is, is to deal at a high level with very, uh, very core issues that set the trajectory and the course of the study and the discipline here. My hope is that next year when we have this conference that it will also be on biblical counseling, but it will be now dealing with the very practical side. Okay, now that we've got all that, that groundwork laid and we're, we're following scripture and we're using this hermeneutic, uh, what does it look like when I'm sitting in front of somebody? Uh, and, I, and I just wanted to encourage you with that. Hang in there as we work through the, the, uh, the, the theory aspects and then come back next year as we talk about the very, very practical aspects that I know uh, are very, very important as well. Now, in this, this uh, last session, um, 
I'll be talking about the general distinctives of this approach. Uh, Dr. Smith dealt with the specific distinctives, and so I'm going to kind of broaden out a little bit and look at uh, psychology and counseling as disciplines born from the biblical worldview. And then after uh, I finish, we'll have some Q&A. Uh, Dr. Smith will come up and uh, then afterwards give us a, a very quick summary and closing, and then you'll be all welcome to join us for, uh, for dinner. Uh, or, or supper, I should say. Yes, supper. Dinner was earlier, apparently, depending on where you're from. We'll eat food. How about that? Well, let's, uh, let's go to Lord in prayer as we get this session started. Precious Father, thank you for your love and faithfulness. Thank you uh, for giving us the, the tools that we need to be able to understand who you are, who we are, how to love you, how to love each other, and again, I, I just ask that we handle your word well, that we uh, treat each other well, and that we uh, are edifying and building up one another. So we, we thank you for the day that we've had and the time we have, and we just commit the remainder of it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's start with uh, an introduction to worldview. In order to be sufficiently comprehensive and reliable, any thoroughgoing worldview must address four major areas of inquiry. Number one, how can we know what is true or not? Epistemology. Number two, what is real? Metaphysics. Three, what should a person do? Ethics. And four, what should we do in community? Sociopolitical. There's an obvious necessitated order to these questions, and that necessity should guide any discipline. We can't answer sociopolitical questions until we first deal with ethics, as one can't address how to behave in community if the question of how to behave hasn't been addressed in the first place. The questions of ethics can't be answered without an adequate metaphysic that addresses what actually exists, ontology, what is good, axiology, what is the design or purpose, teleology, and what will happen in the future, eschatology. Without having the foundational answers to these guiding questions, one could never prescribe properly. Without an accurate description of what is, one cannot instruct about what should be. Metaphysics' answers are preface to ethical inquiry. We can't handle ethics until we answer questions of metaphysics, and we can't answer the metaphysics questions until we address the epistemological ones. Before metaphysics questions about reality, good, purpose, and the future can be answered, we have to know where to go for reliable answers. Epistemology, then, constitutes the first necessary stage of inquiry in worldview. Whom shall we trust? To whom can we go for knowledge? With what tools shall we embark on that journey? Answering these questions are the foundational role of epistemology. In particular, we must understand what is the source of authority on which the entire worldview is built and how we can have certainty that we can properly understand that source of authority. Throughout the worldview investigation, it is important to distinguish that which is and that which ought to be. Descriptions of reality constitute that which is, and the prescriptions which result constitute the ought. Without answering questions pertaining to descriptions of what is, we have no basis for addressing questions of what ought to be prescribed. In any worldview, that which ought to be flows directly from what is. From descriptions come prescriptions. Have I beaten that dead horse enough? It is incumbent upon any worldview, if it is to be trusted, to address each of these questions and to do so in a way that corresponds to reality if the resulting worldview is to reflect an accurate perspective of reality. Perhaps the greatest challenge in pursuing this meta-narrative is the obvious need for a first step of faith. In pursuing foundational epistemological answers, one must decide at the outset whom or what that investigator will trust. One must take a leap of faith, basing their very first step on a pre-commitment. That leap of faith can be tested and evaluated as the worldview begins to take shape, but there's no such luxury at the beginning of the process. Shall one trust human experience as the ultimate authority of truth? David Hume answers in the affirmative, undergirding his worldview with a naturalistic epistemology. Hume's empirical approach allows no room whatsoever for the supernatural as his first step of faith blinds him to that possibility. 
Shall one trust human reason as the ultimate authority of truth, interpreting all phenomena through the lens of guided thought? Rene Descartes answers in the affirmative, grounding his worldview with a rationalistic epistemology. Descartes' rationalism understands the phenomena independent of external voices as reason is sufficient to comprehend the function of nature and the existence of anything beyond the natural. Shall one trust only themselves to be the arbiter of truth, interpreting life and experience through the lens of their own existence? Frederick Nietzsche answers in the affirmative, building his worldview on an egocentric perspective since he doesn't believe that any other basis for meaning can be understood or trusted. Nietzsche's faith is in himself, Descartes' faith in reason, and Hume's faith in experience are three common epistemological pre-commitments representative of much contemporary thought. But it's important to realize that there is another far more viable option, the biblical worldview. In the biblical worldview, the first step of faith is, is faith in the biblical God. He's revealed himself in three ways, in general revelation through that which has been created, in personal revelation with Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, God revealed in person, and in special revelation in the original autographs of the biblical text. God's revelation in nature is sufficient for all to have the knowledge of his invisible attributes, eternal power, and divine nature. His revelation in Jesus Christ allows all to access the Father through the person and work of the Son. God's special revelation, the written word of God, provides all that is needed for the believer in him to be equipped for everything he has designed his people to do. In the biblical model, God is the source of authority. And our worldview inquiry seeks to understand him through his revelation in Scripture as creation simply introduces us to him and his son has revealed the Father in written word that he commissioned. The second task of a biblical epistemology is to discern a hermeneutic in the Bible itself. If we have to go outside the Bible to answer this important question, then the resulting worldview is no longer rooted in the Bible. It is most helpful, then, that the Bible does actually provide a hermeneutic method that we can easily follow. In the book of Genesis are found nearly a hundred references to God speaking, and in each of the speech acts in which the response is evident in the context, God either interprets himself or other listeners interpret him in a normative, literal, grammatical, historical way. This sets a vital precedent. Genesis spans the first 2,000 years of recorded history. Consequently, the hermeneutic model provided in the book is indicative of how God expects to be understood. In short, the Bible illustrates an internal hermeneutic method and sufficiently addresses the epistemological question of how we are to interpret the source of authority. Once the epistemological questions are resolved, the biblicist will be able to confidently answer the metaphysics questions of ontology, axiology, teleology, and eschatology. And by the way, every single one of the 11 categories of systematic theology fit into one of those four categories, and some in more than one. It's in this context that we first encounter the need for psychology as a legitimate inquiry and as a discipline properly engaged within a biblical worldview. In considering what actually exists, ontology, we are met with the person of God who creates all that exists and thus has sovereign rights over all of his creation. As the sovereign, he defines what is good, axiology. He defines what is good in general and he defines what is good for his creation. He determines the design and the purpose for all things, teleology. And he declares that all serves to express his glory. As the creator of all, he has determined the outcome and revealed much of it, including his framework of covenants and promises to Abraham and his descendants, his plan for redemption, his plan for the nation of Israel, for other nations, and for his church, his plan for the prophetic calendar and the installation of his kingdom on earth, for judgment and fulfillment, and for the ushering in of eternity. Within these detailed explanations of metaphysical truth is found much about the human soul and mind. God created humanity as male and female in his image and for his purposes. He designed humanity to be spirit and or soul and to have body, heart, soul, mind, and flesh. 
Because of the first man's sin, all who follow are stained with sin, and all have a brokenness added to what God had designed, falling short of his glory and being by nature children of wrath. That brokenness includes a separation of human from creator. And physical consequences of that brokenness include dysfunction, ultimately leading to physical death. Those physical consequences impact not just broken humanity, but even every aspect of the physical realm is likewise stained with sin and is profoundly dysfunctional. Because of this great state of disorder, we observe all manner of maladies experienced during the times of the biblical narratives, the foremost of which is the spiritual separation, but which also include physical ailments and illnesses, mental dysfunction, spiritual oppression and possession, and the pervasive, self-destructive tendencies of the flesh. The metaphysics revealed in the biblical record are thankfully not limited to the otherwise hopelessness of humanity's sinful condition. We also discover in the narrative how God intervened in order to overcome sin and its consequences, how positional righteousness and right relationship was paid for by Christ's sacrifice, how those provisions are applied to the individual by faith in Jesus the Christ in the moment of justification and the new birth, how through the process of sanctification, many of the consequences of sin are being countered daily, and at the culmination in glorification, the believer will see the destructive impact of sin completely resolved. Let's consider the discipline of psychology in relation to epistemology and metaphysics. So we've seen the epistemology of the scriptures, God is the source of authority, literal grammatical historical hermeneutics. We've seen the metaphysics of the scriptures, descriptive. Let's think about the context of psychology. These are some of the key metaphysical descriptions found in scripture comprising the first foundational principles of the discipline of psychology. If one ignores these revelations, as do the humanistic and naturalistic worldviews, then there's no hope for properly ascertaining a psychology that corresponds to reality. Empirical tools only provide access to a small fraction of these truths, and if those are the only tools implied, then the resulting psychology will be necessarily and woefully limited, if not completely errant. It is worth noting that science does not compete with biblical epistemology, but rather complements it. Science is only potent in particular contexts, it is abundantly descriptive of life, but doesn't decipher the origin of life. It measures functions of mind, but doesn't help us understand the derivation of mind. It does not comment intelligently on whether or not the will is free, nor does it shed light on the interaction problem, how the material and the immaterial intersect, or if there is even such an intersection. The limits of science can extend only as far as the human sensory apparatus and the human reasoning apparatus intersect. As long as those who would pursue science acknowledge that limitation, the pursuit can be engaged with requisite humility, and resulting conclusions can be completely compatible with the biblical worldview. Further, the conflict between science and the biblical worldview arises when it is assumed that the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world is all that exists. That assumption demands that science is the only reliable vehicle for deriving truth and knowledge. On the other hand, where it is acknowledged that reality, reality extends or at least could possibly extend beyond the physical and natural world, there is a humility that calls for more comprehensive tools of measure that reach beyond simply the reasoning and experiential apparatus. The core distinctions between psychology and the biblical worldview versus the naturalistic perspectives are first evident in epistemology with reliance on differing sources of authority. The biblical worldview depends entirely on God as revealed in Scripture and encourages investigation through that lens. Naturalistic worldviews consider reason, experience, or the self as the source of authority and pursue investigation with a very limited set of empirical tools. The resultant metaphysical conclusions are not shockingly disparate because in the naturalistic model, extra-natural scriptural evidence is not allowed. Thus, the conclusion stemming from that evidential data is discarded completely. 
While psychology to this point has been considered here largely in its descriptive context, working from epistemological and metaphysical foundations, the practical value of the study is in providing prescriptions for appropriately caring for the soul and the mind. And once the epistemological questions have been addressed, one can address the metaphysical ones. Together, these inquiries comprise the descriptive or the is. And once that groundwork has been laid, we move on to the ought considering the prescriptions demanded by the foundational truths that have been understood. In psychology, this practical and prescriptive element related to treatment and care of the soul and mind is often refer referred to simply as counseling. So let's consider the discipline of counseling in relation to ethics and sociopolitical interaction, the other two components of worldview. The biblical worldview builds an important bridge from is to ought, from descriptive to prescriptive. Paul, for example, reveals that bridge in his letters to the Romans and to the Ephesians. Romans addresses epistemological and metaphysical questions in chapters 1 through 11, and in 12.1 he challenges believers in light of those foundational answers to present their bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. He further explains that this is the believer's reasonable service of worship. First outlining the description, Paul can then voice a call to action. Without the description, there's no basis for the prescription. He utilizes the same device in his letter to the Ephesians, first addressing in chapters 1 through 3 the epistemological and metaphysical elements related to the believer's identity, discussing at length the believer's divine calling. Then in 4.1, he calls the reader to action, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. In both of these contexts, Paul's description of reality undergirds the prescription. The description provides necessary foundations for the call to action to have significance. In both letters, Paul develops a great deal of psychological material. Both deal with human identity and the reality of the human experience. Both demonstrate how God's involvement in that experience is life-giving and empowering. Paul considers elements of the mind extensively in both letters. Paul considers the soul and makes extensive reference to the human spirit. That extensive psychological data helps us put into context the exhortations that comprise the ethics of the biblical worldview. In Ephesians 4 through 6, as one example, Paul offers many ethical prescriptions, but especially noteworthy with respect to counseling are the exhortations that A, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects of him. B, we no longer walk in the futility of the mind. C, that we lay aside the old self, be renewed in the spirit of our mind, and put on the new self. D, that we speak only that which is edifying. E, that we be forgiving. F, that we are not to be deceived by empty words. G, that we try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. H, that we be filled with the Holy Spirit. I, that we speak to one another in edifying song and thankfulness. J, that we engage properly in every relationship. And K, that we understand and take up the armor of God for sustaining in spiritual battle. These prescriptions are vital applications of psychological data revealed in the previous chapters and illustrate that the ethics of Scripture rely on the positional and foundational truths that comprise biblical epistemology. Peter, for example, in both of his letters, continually reminds believers of who they are, what God has done for them, and what the future holds. He does this always as a context setting for a call to action. 1 Peter 1-12 through 12 considers the living hope of the believer in Christ. And the very next verse challenges the reader to prepare the mind for action and be unwaveringly fixed upon Christ. To undergird the prescription of 122 that believers fervently one, love one another, he reminds his readers of their identity, metaphysics, and the trustworthiness of God's word, epistemology. Biblical counseling is one way we stimulate one another to love and good deeds, as Hebrews 10.24 encourages us to do. Applying the epistemological and metaphysical foundations of Scripture in ethics, individually and sociopolitical interaction in community. In the biblical worldview, there are two essential recipients of ethical prescriptions. First is the unbeliever. 
Biblical ethics for them is fairly straightforward. Their primary responsibility is to believe in him. Biblical ethics for the believer is much more detailed, as there are perhaps more than a thousand directives in the New Testament for believers to follow. The purpose of biblical counseling is to encourage one another to be more like Christ in our thinking, our speaking, and our actions. Thus, counseling can play a helpful and needed role in the sanctification process for believers. For unbelievers, biblical counseling can help them with their primary directive to believe in Jesus. And while counseling can be of great help to unbelievers as an expression of common grace, the overarching desired outcome is that they become new creatures who have the mind of Christ and are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. While not all aspects of psychology uh, are not merely descriptive and not all aspects of counseling are merely prescriptive, generally the descriptions of the biblical model for psychology lead directly to the biblical prescriptions for counseling. If the psychological data and foundations are rooted in a different worldview, Hume's, Descartes, or Nietzsche's, for example, then the counseling prescriptions will necessarily look very different. The general distinctiveness of the model we're advocating is that it be rooted in and engaged through biblical authority as the fundamental epistemological truth, with the biblical descriptions providing the essential metaphysical concepts through which we understand human psychology and undergirding the prescriptions for the purpose and approach to counseling. Observation and scientific pursuit are very important as long as their limitations are acknowledged. They can be invaluable tools in properly applying the metaphysical concepts presented in Scripture. If, on the other hand, we fail to put those tools in their proper place as limited devices for considering the metaphysical principles impact on human experience, then we begin to mishandle and distort the first two stages of worldview, and we're no longer operating anywhere close to the biblical worldview. It is necessary that we do psychology according to the biblical worldview without integrating any other competing worldview concepts with the biblical foundations. If we embark on this journey faithfully, guarding those boundaries, then we can be assured of coming much closer to understanding that which corresponds to reality as the Creator designed and sees it than we otherwise would if we add our own limited perspectives, whether they be extra-biblical theological presuppositions or secular pre-commitments to leave Him out of the equation altogether. Just as Paul cautions believers not to be taken captive through philosophies that are not according to Christ, we must examine every aspect of our worldview to assure alignment with His Word. Anytime we step outside the boundaries of His worldview, we're no longer engaging in the philosophy according to Christ, but are instead being captivated by competing worldviews and by empty deceptions. And the chart here just illustrates the focus on the Word of God, biblical authority, biblical sufficiency, and how we can stray from that in varying degrees. On the one side, adding tradition to the Bible, moving into integrationism. On the other side, adding secular humanism to the Bible, and guess what that is? Integrationism. Uh, next, we can integrate tradition with the Bible. That's legalism. Uh, we can further integrate secular humanism with the Bible, and that's liberalism. We can complement Tradition with the Bible, tradition comes first, that's Pharisaism. We can complement secular humanism with the Bible, that's existentialism. And then 180 degrees due south, we can deny biblical authority and biblical sufficiency altogether, which is secularism. And the key here is to be going due north all the time, guided by the authority and sufficiency of Scripture. Thoughts, comments, questions, critiques, crucifixions. I'm not sure about using a compass built on a concept of secularism, using that for true north is very good. Brilliant. Galileo would approve. Could you expand a little bit on the socio-political interaction and, Good. And, and how you see that factoring into the counseling process? Good. If, uh, 
if you could possibly scroll to page two and show the components of worldview chart on uh, the middle of page two, that would be helpful in addressing this question. Perfect, thank you. Uh, you deserve a cookie. Daniel has been exercising tremendous discipline with the cookie next to him. I'm just curious to see how long that lasts. So in, in worldview, you'll notice on the far left of this chart, the is and the ought, okay? Epistemology and metaphysics comprise the is, it's descriptive. Uh, ethics and sociopolitical are the ought, what we ought to do about the metaphysical truths that the scripture present. Uh, many times our arguments and our discussions go right to the sociopolitical. Uh, and we, we deal with these major arguments about social issues when we really should go all the way back to the beginning and, and assess epistemology and then metaphysics and then ethics and then we arrive at sociopolitical discussions. And if we're doing this right, following the scriptures at each step, we'll end up in the same place with the same answers. It's just how it works. But sociopolitical, uh, the, the concept there is that ethics are, uh, are the shoulds or the oughts for the individual what I should do, what I'm supposed to do. But then that changes a little bit when we are now two or three of us or we're, we're operating in community. Uh, you know, we're, we're here a part of a campus, uh, part of a university. We're part of local churches. We're also part of the universal body of Christ, right? Uh, we're part of cities and states and countries and, and uh, uh, even in our sports allegiances, we like to to group uh, and, and have these socio-political communities that way. We do it on social media. We, we, are, we are tribal in that sense. And uh, it's important to understand that the Bible speaks to individual ethics and to that tribal element, if I can use that term, uh, of our engaging in community. As, as uh, our brother spoke earlier, referencing Galatians uh, 610, it says, do, do good to all men, especially the household of faith. So now there's, there's a, a sociopolitical principle there that, uh, that I'm supposed to be doing good to all without exception. I'm supposed to be beneficial to everyone I come in contact with. But there's a prioritization of the body of Christ. And so I have to weigh that as I'm uh, working through the stewardship of resources. I have to prioritize as as the scriptures tell me to prioritize. Peter says something similar in uh, 1 Peter 2, 17. He says to honor all people, right? Uh, and so there's this concept that in these various relationships, we have responsibilities. Uh, take, for example, a man's responsibility is to love God and love everybody else. But a husband's responsibility in that, in that community of husband and wife, there's this community of two people, now his responsibility is to love that specific woman like Christ loved the church. And then as that community expands, now then you see the children at the beginning of Ephesians chapter six, uh, now he's supposed to treat these children differently than his wife, right? So you, you begin to see how communities are designed to, to operate. Uh, and it's, it's not contradictory to the ethics in the sense of the individual responsibilities, it, it, it goes to the next step. Am I at all answering your question? What I meant by sociopolitical? Yes. Yeah, socio just in the sense of uh, uh, community and group and the, the political aspect just in the sense of structure and organization, that there are there are, there are group structures revealed in scripture that give us uh, ethical uh, mandates beyond the individual. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. I don't often get to explain that. I'm thinking they're, they're going to let me off the hook. <clears throat> Dinner's not for a little while, so you're... You're not that far. And if, and if I don't answer questions, Luther's just going to come up and talk for two hours anyway. But you'd rather, you'd rather hear him talk, so. Clay. 
You're good listeners. You've all been awake. You know, um, something, something that was said earlier, you would hope to, you know, by having this conference and, you know, drilling down on what is truly biblical counseling, you were hoping to, you know, like it be a landmark that would move some things forward. Do you have any idea, um, you know, how you could set that one rolling? Good. So the, the question that we've been considering is what makes counseling biblical? And that, that's kind of just an investigative question. And so for us, we're, we're trying to address that question, but lay a foundation not as this is anything new, it isn't. Nothing that, we're, that any of us have said uh, today has been novel. Um, but what we're trying to affirm is a, a clear distinctions, understanding the distinction between the discipline and the, and the worldview, uh, the study and the inquiry versus the presuppositions, uh, uh, recognizing the descriptive versus the prescriptive, and understanding that our authority is God's word. And so... Uh, my hope is that, number one, this answers questions for, for those who are wondering where is Calvary coming from on this issue? Because as, as has been presented, there are a number of different models out there, um, and it can be difficult sometimes from a distance to ascertain where someone is or where an institution is or a church is even, right? Mm -hmm. And so my hope is that, that we've been able to clarify that today uh, to express those, those, that, that reliance and dependence on the Word of God as not only foundational but the guiding truth for every step of the journey. Um, secondly, uh, the, the project that, that, that we've been working with today has, has been to uh, uh, complement one another to be able to communicate this position so that we can... Uh, uh, publish this again later this summer and, and offer a, a bit of a primer for anyone who's wanting to engage biblical counseling and, and wanting to deal with those foundational elements. Uh, and so these things have been happening here at, at Calvary for, you know, uh, three to four years, if not longer in, in, in different departments. So again, this is really nothing new, but I think this is the first time that Calvary's undergrad and grad departments have really been, uh, and along with the seminary, been fully unified in this pursuit. So I think, I think it is a bit of a landmark for us that we are able to say, this is where we're coming from. We're, we're standing united with differences among us, right? These various nuances, but to be able to write and communicate and uh, hopefully be able to contribute to the discipline and, and hopefully encourage other institutions other psychologists and counselors to, to have confidence in, in the Word of God. So uh, did I answer your question at all? <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, but, um, and I have a, yet another question for you. For a pastor, um, I have a kind of a rule with people when they want to come for counseling, and especially if they have a a long-term problem that's taken many years to develop and they really do need to take some time and work it through. Um, if I have to work with them for like two or three times or more, if it start, if it looks like we're going to be 12, 16 weeks, I refer them on. I, yeah, I just, just don't have time and it also creates an uncomfortable environment for them, you know, to uh, to be taught beer and add all their dirty laundry with the people that they fellowship with every week, you know, even though I'd never tell anybody, they don't know that. So, you know, I know that creates a discomfort. Have you folks ever considered uh, an outreach into the community to where, say, Kansas City, you would have a clinic in the Northland, East, West, Central, and South? I mean, you know, Kansas City, is pretty much divided up into those four areas, you know, and, you know, like uh, KCK, Blue Springs, Parkville, Grandview, um, you know, where you would be able to feed your kids into a Calvary University counseling practice I, uh, I, when they graduate. I love how you think. And uh, you know, Cal Calvary has had a counseling center in the past, 
We closed that down to be able to refine and do some, some necessary groundwork over the past couple of years. And we absolutely have discussed uh, and have a developing plan to have a counseling center. Uh, we also, I would add, in addition to the Kansas City element, uh, we also have activities in Colorado with our campus out there. And then, of course, uh, uh, on CEF's campus over in, uh, in Warrington. So we're trying, as, as we have opportunities to work with various churches and, and locations and ministries, to, to be really effective there. And to, to do that well, we have to have the foundation right. And so I think this is a very important first step. The next step, as I mentioned, God willing, next year, we're here talking about the very practical elements. Uh, and uh, I might even, we might recruit you in, into that discussion. So I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not formally asking you yet, so don't tell me no yet. We'll argue off, off camera. Well, but, I'm, yeah, I'm not, but well, you know, one of the things, Dr. Cohn, is like, like if you would want to put something north of the river, I would engage my elder board of hosting it at our church, you know, to where the person, done. the people could have a, an office at our church to where we, you wouldn't have to worry about utilities or, or, you know, or anything like that. And we get them their own phone line and, and uh, things like that. Then you don't have to go buy office space, you know, and uh, you could, we would be uh, Northwest Bible Church and Calvary Counseling Center. I mean, you know, and again, so maybe somebody over in Shawnee or somebody in Blue Springs or Grandview. You know, mm, if you Shawnee. partner with a local mm. church, you could do this fairly low Amen. cost if you're only paying the salary of the people that are working there. That's Amen. And that's, a, that's incredibly gracious. And, and I have to say, Calvary University exists to come alongside the church and to help pastors and, and help the body of Christ do ministry. That's magnificent. And uh, I am certain that we will take you up on that. Okay. Yes, Dr. Smith? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Excellent. That kind of partnership is absolutely vital. Anything else? How about I close us in prayer? We'll have a little... Uh, uh, well, actually, I'll close us in prayer uh, because I like to do that at the end of my sessions, but uh, Dr. Smith will come up and give us a, a summary and a, a conclusion uh, of, of the conference, and then, and then we'll take a bit of time to have some fellowship and then uh, share, share dinner. So let me, let me pray while my brother comes up. Precious Lord, again, I, I'm just grateful to be able to spend this time with my brothers and sisters today, thinking through these issues, and uh, I'm, I'm thankful for those who have put so much into this conference to be able to communicate, uh, to seek to communicate your word and your truth accurately. And I just pray that, uh, uh, that this would be encouraging and edifying, and uh, that we would put these things into practice, and that we would do something about it. Uh, so, Lord, again, I, I'm just thankful, and as, as Luther uh, closes us out for today, I, th I thank you for him and for his leadership in our counseling department. And I pray that you would bless him and the faculty uh, who are, are serving faithfully, Lord. So, again, we're grateful and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's all yours, brother. So just a few closing statements. Um, what is, what makes counseling biblical? Um, briefly, we just, we started off uh, this morning talking about the difference between a discipline or a worldview, right? That a discipline is a field of study that is meant to be observed objectively, and that the worldview is that which informs what we observe, right? From uh, seemingly natural phenomena, we talked about uh, deconstructing psychology, right, um, and the components, that there is a psychology to biblical counseling, that there is an examination of how we know what we know, that is epistemology. Uh, does one simply rely on their senses or their reason to determine what is real? There was a review of determinism and volunteerism and how that interplay and exchange uh, comes up lacking and then there was a historical tour, uh, or a historical philosophical tour of psychology, which uh, 
uh, Dr. Cohn uh, laid out for us. And he concluded that the problem is not the discipline itself, but it is the worldviews that are observed and governed within the discipline that make the difference. Then uh, Dr. Brain talked about the priority of scripture, gave some definitions concerning biblical counseling, what it is, and then gave the explanation uh, that it is biblical. He discussed the importance of natural revelation and special revelation and then concluded looking at sufficiency, inerrancy, infallibility and concluded that the Bible is the source of authority for all things and that in order for us to do biblical counseling well, that the priority of scripture must be the objective. Dr. Cox brilliantly talked about where, how, where can wisdom be found. He took a look starting with the book of Job and concluded that the goal of biblical counseling was simply to get wisdom. He gave a detailed response concerning the counseling wars and some of the details associated with that and concluded that this war is primarily theological with the uh, difficulty that the word biblical is somewhat uh, infused with a lot of meaning concerning these theological aspects. He detailed the history of the biblical counseling movement and concluded that it adds a lot of minutia to what actually considers care. And he observed very succinctly and concisely that we can obtain scripture, that we can attain wisdom through the scriptures, but also the world around us, as he observed in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. We looked at the specific approach, um, the consistent literal grammatical historical method. We had observed uh, several models, one of them being the God is not model, the other model being the assimilation model, and then the other model being the theological model, and concluded that the God is not model doesn't fit the criteria of what it means to be biblical. The assimilation model bifurcates what's material and what's not, and that the theological model works instead, instead uh, from systematic theology rather than from a consistent hermeneutical method. As a matter of fact, all of them, to some extent, lack that. Then lastly, we talked about uh, a worldview tour, the general distinctiveness of psychology. And we looked at a worldview tour, specifically um, epistemology, metaphysics, ethics, and sociopolitical. We observed uh, the metaphysical and epistemological points of psychology and observed the difference of counseling in light of ethics and sociopolitical. Uh, we saw the patterns of the epistles and the examples of Paul when he, uh, when he does this in Ephesians, stating in chapters 1 and 3, the, epi the uh, epistemological and metaphysical uh, components of man and mankind, the substance of mankind, the destiny of mankind, what is good, what is true, and then concluded with the um, ethical and the sociopolitical in chapters four and six, and then concluded that to have, uh, not to start with the ethical and sociopolitical, but the metaphysical and the epistemological in order to straighten that out first before we go on to what we ought to do. I hope that this uh, um, conference has been beneficial to all of you. Uh, I thank you guys for coming and participating in this um, um, and continuing the discussion. I'm looking forward to some of the discussions I'll have with you even later on as we continue to explore this topic. Um, I thank you so much uh, for uh, coming here and spending your day with us, and I will pray and close us out. Let's pray. Lord, there's a lot of information that we've covered in a short amount of time. We believe that this topic is very important. We believe that there's no direction that we can travel, no place that we can go where you have not spoken. And it's just the practice and the constant activity for us to understand what you desire for us and how um, you uh, transform our outlook on the world and how we are to view 
things, specifically mankind, the interactions with mankind, what plagues mankind, the ills of mankind, and the ultimate destiny of where we're going. I pray, God, that this conversation would continue, that we would continue to refine um, um, our positions, and that we would not do so from our opinions, from our perspectives, from commentaries, from, uh, from theologies, but, Lord, we would do so by the grounding of your scripture. And by that, may we be motivated to serve and love our neighbor, all to the glory of you. We love you so much, Lord, and we thank you for this time. For it's in your son's name. Amen.